Okay, so we're going to cover some of the basic pesticide safety and health and environmental related information in about three different 15 minute talks today. This first one is about the laws and regs side of things. And as you all know, FIFRA is the federal regulation that governs all aspects of, of uh, what you do in your pesticide applications and whether or not you need a license and, and all those sorts of things. It covers a whole range of things, of course, uh, but I did want to highlight this idea that real broadly FIFRA uh, divides chemicals into general use products and restricted use products. Now for the most part, those of you in this category, if you're using general use products, you don't have to have a license. But there are some exceptions that are listed there. If you're doing ornamental and turf or structural applications for hire, you, you would need a license even if you are only applying general use products. Also in the public health category, if any of you uh, might get hired by a city or a village or something like that or a county to uh, control adult mosquitoes, in a case like that, even if you're only using general use products, you still would have to have a, a license in that public health category. But the restricted use products, the RUPs, that's what uh, the reason we're here. It's when you use those products, you're required to uh, hold a license. And that includes whether you buy it, apply it, or supervise its use. Any of those things requ requires a license. Now in your uh, proceedings, the yellow book proceedings on page 77 starts a lot of uh, several publications that relate to pesticide safety information. And at the top of the slides, I'll often refer to uh, which particular NEB guide or publication that I'm referring to. Uh, obviously, there's so much detailed information that we could cover, uh, but there's just too much of it. We just don't have enough time, so I'll highlight each of those different areas, and then I'll invite you later to take a look at those publications for more details, or if uh, questions come up throughout the year or something like that. But I do want to talk about record keeping a little bit. Uh, you know, when you get visited by Ag Department, uh, often the first thing they'll do is identify themselves. They'll ask for your certification card. But very soon after that, they're going to want to see uh, examples of your records. And records or lack of records get people into trouble more than anything else uh, out there from what I've been able to observe. And it's because each one of these points that are bulleted there are required to be kept as part of your record system. And one in particular in the past several years has gotten people into trouble as the method of disposal. And literally, Ag Department wants you to state that there was no disposal if you had no product left over. It seems a little odd, but that's what their requirement is, so we need to go ahead and follow it. If you had a little bit of product left over and you sprayed it out on the next field, for instance, you need to state that, because that would be considered disposal when it wasn't a, a planned uh, application. Now your records can be kept as handwritten records. You can do it as part of your invoicing system uh, electronically. It really doesn't matter how you keep the records. The key is that when asked for those records, you have to be able to produce those and, and supply those for your Ag Department uh, folks. Real quickly, shifting over to endangered species. There's a good NIP guide in there that, that covers that pretty well. Uh, EPA has taken a, a different kind of an approach about this. Uh, they actually have a regulation that's in effect right now, uh, but what we are waiting for in Nebraska is for information to appear on pesticide labels that we use. Now when it does, it's going to list uh, something about endangered species information. It's going to list a URL for a website. When that information appears on the label, you're now obligated to go to that website and check and see if there's any bulletins that are present on that website for your area, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a little bit different a way of thinking about things, but anytime within six months of making that application, you have to check that website, and if there are endangered species near where you plan to make your application, you're, you have to follow what the uh, bulletins say in terms of buffers or, or other measures that you might take. So that's kind of a heads up. The NPDES permitting thing, you may not have heard it referred to that way, uh, uh, but what happened is that uh, EPA for years, basically the way they dealt with the Clean Water Act was saying that if you are in compliance with FIFRA, you're not, uh, you don't have to worry about the Clean Water Act, you're not in uh, violation of it. 
The Clean Water Act says if you apply near or over or directly to any of the waters of the U.S. that you're releasing a pollutant and you need to get a permit in order to do that. Well, EPA had been just given a blanket permit in essence. What happened was uh, the courts threw that out and uh, EPA asked for a two-year stay on that uh, decision in order to allow them time to figure out basically what they're going to do next. And in the case of Nebraska, uh, the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality has been working with EPA and they're very near uh, reaching a final draft for a regulation that's going to uh, cover that. I think a good 90% of you are not going to be affected at all. They'll just continue as is. But if you do applications along irrigation canals or uh, if you do mosquito control or uh, aquatic weed control, you, you will be affected and you'll want to pay attention to this. What, uh, these permits have to be in effect by April of this year. And so what uh, UNL Extension and the Ag Department and the Nebraska Environmental Quality have decided to do is we're going to write a fact sheet and we're going to send a letter to all of the applicators in the state, private and commercial and non-commercial applicators. And, and our thinking was that we didn't want to uh, get misleading information out there ahead of time, which so often happens with these kind of regulations. So we wanted to wait until it was fully in effect and we're going to notify you that way. So watch for that letter and read it, see if it affects you, and if it does you're going to have to uh, follow some different procedures. There's another NEB guide that uh, has to do with pesticide container uh, regulations and secondary containment. This is also a new regulation within the last two or three years that EPA has put out. It deals with non-refillable and refillable pesticide containers. The non-refillables are the smaller jugs that you use the c contents, you rinse them, then you recycle the containers. Basically the biggest change is that uh, the labels are going to contain better cleaning instructions and disposal uh, instructions, which has been kind of lacking in the past. So that, that should be a good thing. So watch for changes on your labels that are going to give you better guidance there. Then by the end of this summer, uh, there, the uh, refillable containers, the mini bulks and any other container like that, will have to have Department of Transportation markings. They'll have to be serial numbered. They want to be able to track them all the way from manufacture until at some point when they're not usable any longer. And then it has to have a tamper resistant or, or one-way type valves installed. So the end result of this is there's going to be a lot of containers out there that won't be in compliance uh, as of the end of this summer. They will not be able to be refilled. So uh, one thing that I'm aware of that has happened is that this last summer uh, a company called Trirents worked with UNL Extension and the Ag Department to contact many of the dealerships around the state and uh, those dealerships that responded back to their survey were able to participate in a recycling program. So I'm hoping they're going to continue that this summer. If they do, watch for that notification and the only way you can participate is to respond to that letter uh, with the, uh, uh, the survey that they send out. So. Uh, hopefully that's a good way to get these things recycled and get them out of the system because we're not going to be able to use them any longer. Now the con secondary containment aspect of this new regulation, we already had the Title 198 in effect in Nebraska and that has been accepted more or less as is by EPA as being in compliance. So we're in good shape there. We just continue doing things the way uh, we always have with that. Now, the worker protection standard obviously is a very large regulation. As you know, you've been working in this area uh, for some time. I, I think of the worker protection standard, its main goal really is to protect applicators, which they call handlers, and ag workers from pesticides. And the way they do that is by using the restricted in entry intervals and uh, PPE requirements. Okay, now. Um, Obviously, like I said, there's a lot of more details that are involved in this and um, I do invite you to go online and get a copy of this how to comply manual. It's a good thing to have. Uh, you can save an electronic version on your, on your desktop or whatever uh, you'd like to do, but I do uh, invite you to get more information about the worker protection standard. You can get it through our website here at pested.unl.edu and look under that certification and licensing. 
Now, communication is a really important thing between uh, like a custom applicator and, uh, and the farmer. And so we produce this little video that helps dramatize that a little bit. And let's go ahead and play that now, I think. scenario shows an example of what notification procedures are required by pesticide applicators and their customers to comply with the worker protection standard. Hello. Hi Mr. Smith. I just wanted to let you know that I'm about to spray your corn with headline SC fungicide. The weather is fine, so I won't need to delay the application. There is a 12-hour re-entry interval on it, so you and other workers should avoid going in the area until tomorrow. Great. Thanks for uh, calling, and I'll let everybody know. Hey, Joe. They're going to be spraying the corn today, so don't go in the field until tomorrow. Uh, we better tell the detasslers not to go in there till Friday. I'll, I'll give them a call and let them know. Okay, great. All right. Hi, Hello, what can I do for you? Uh, we got a call from your husband yesterday about the problem with the irrigation system. I uh, just wanted to let you know that I'm heading out to check it out. Yes, that would be in our cornfield, and it's that direction. Thank you. Uh-huh. Great. Thanks for uh, calling and I'll let everybody know. Susan, the guy's here to spray the corn. We're not supposed to get in there till tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go talk to Joe. All right. You know, the repair company is supposed to come sometime in the next couple of days to fix the irrigation pump system. Since we're not supposed to go in there, they aren't either. I'll call and let them know not to come till after tomorrow. Okay, good. Okay. Hmm. In order to comply with the worker protection standard, pesticide applicators should always tell their customers before they are going to do an application. If there are any delays to the planned application date, such as rain in the forecast, the applicator should inform the customer of the change as soon as reasonably possible, and then arrange for a different application date. The customer, such as a farmer, must then notify his own workers about re-entry intervals as well as other service or utility workers, such as public power district employees and field scouts, who may be coming to do work for the customer and may have potential to be exposed to the pesticide. It's also a good idea to let your family know what's going on to prevent them from entering the treated area and in case they need to talk to a worker in your absence. Notification is very important, not only in ag settings, such as seen in this scenario, but also in any other settings where worker protection standard information appears on the label. Okay, just a few points to keep in mind, keeping those lines of communication open and, and letting everybody who could potentially be affected know about those applications will just help keep everybody a little bit safer. Just real quickly on the idea of the pesticide label, uh, touch on the aspect that labels can vary depending on the type of application or work that you're doing with respect to the product. In this case, it, this happens to be an atrazine label. It talks about applicators and other handlers. It lists a set of PPE that they need to wear. But then the last one says a chemical resistant apron if you're exposed to the undiluted product. So it doesn't always explicitly say mixer loader, but that's what it's talking about. If you're doing the, the mixing uh, operation, you have to add additional PPE to what the others are. Another thing to keep in mind is that labels can vary uh, for the same active ingredient what type of PPE might be required. In this case, glyphosate labels. Uh, this may have changed, but a few years ago, 8 out of 18 of the glyphosate labels I looked at required uh, eye protection, and the others didn't. So you can imagine you might be using a product that did not require the 
eye protection and then switch to one that maybe did and if you didn't read the label you might find yourself out of compliance and also keep in mind that that those regulations are there for a reason usually there's a reason why you need that eye protection for that particular formulation so uh, I'll be back a little bit later talking about health and environmental related issues just want to let you know our office is available for questions uh, contact me by email look on our website uh, give us a call uh, we'd be glad to help any way we can okay